Well, good evening. Welcome. It's uh, Sunday the 4th of June as we gather together on this virtual platform. We're continuing our journey through the series that we've embarked on in Romans chapter 12. And we come to our fourth in the series. Uh, the series is called Sharpened by Grace. It's all about God's grace and mercy at work in our lives. And then we're going to come face to face with a very particular angle of his grace this evening as we consider the idea of mutual ministry, which is what I've titled uh, this evening. But Frank, I think to preface our time, let's immediately dive straight into a reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 12 is where you want to be if you've got your Bibles in the semi-darkness or Eskimo-induced darkness at home. Romans chapter 12, and I want to read the first eight verses. Uh, we took a gap last week as we went to Indonesia for our uh, missions focus. So I think it's useful just to let the whole text wash over us again. So Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1 through to 8. Then I'll pray and then uh, bring some reflections on this passage, and then we can shift to a time of prayer for our church thereafter. Let's hear the word of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or your logical or your rational worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exalts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Just so far, reads God's word this evening. Talk with that in mind. Let's pray together and ask for the help of the Lord through the power of the Spirit of God to indeed come and to lead us into all truth and open our minds to behold wonderful things from his law. Let's pray together. Now, Father, we come at the end of this day, and uh, we sit in our different spaces, our different homes, and uh, we've gone through probably many things this day. It's uh, no doubt been a busy weekend for, for some. But Lord, we do realize that just to stay attentive and to learn is going to take some uh, effort this evening. Father, we do pray that you would just enable us for the next couple of minutes to be attentive, to be sharp, and to have our minds attuned to what you want to say to us. Lord, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the Bible. And uh, Lord, we do pray that as we turn our attention to that, that we would come humbly and dependently, wanting to both learn from you, but also be changed and to be challenged and to be better equipped, to be better Christians in a response to what you've said. So come and achieve your purposes in our hearts and our minds, we pray. And do we humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think, folks, as we get going this evening and uh, consider those verses, um, I want to take us back into church history and uh, just paint in very, very broad brushstrokes and at high speed a pattern that had prevailed through the centuries. Up to the time of the Reformation, which we know happened early in the 16th century in the, the early 1500s, there was a very clear separation in the lives of the church or in the mind of the church between that which was sacred and that which was secular. If you worked as part of the church, if you were part of the clergy, if you were part of the priesthood, at whatever tier that actually came from the Pope through the cardinals, through the archbishops, the bishops, all the way down to the, the common little monk, there was a recognized clergy. And the medieval church taught that God worked exclusively through a very select group of priests or a class of priests uh, that were alone allowed to do ministry, that were alone allowed to serve, and uh, that was what was regarded as sacred ministry. Everything that wasn't of the priesthood and of the church, in a sense, was, was secular. And if you really wanted to attain God's favor, you needed to be in the, sec uh, in the sacred space, not in the, the sec uh, secular space. And certainly within the Roman Catholic tradition, it was only the priests that were allowed to, to serve. It was only then that we were allowed to administer the seven sacraments of the church, uh, the baptism, 
or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or the Mass. Only the priests could do the confirmation and penance and uh, extreme unction and uh, initiate over the ordinance of marriage. And uh, only them could be attained to the issue of holy orders. But uh, they basically, and that's, that, that was the system that uh, people labored uh, under. If you were outside of that system, all the work that you did was regarded as, in a sense, as second tier, second class. But if you were doing some, something that was sacred within the confines of the church, it was uh, regarded as God-honoring. And uh, only that those that were in could do that, and those that were out couldn't. What happened uh, as one of the spin-offs of the Reformation, not only was the gospel rediscovered, the wonderful truth of justification by faith alone, but one of the spin-offs was this removal of the sacred-secular divide. And that was a crucial step um, as uh, the Reformers and those that came after them grappled with the Bible again in a fresh way. They rediscovered this idea, and it's a biblical idea, that every single Christian can and should be serving the Lord in a particular way. There's no divide between that which is done on the outside and that which is done on the inside. All Christians should be involved in ministry. And as we jump and fast track a little bit through church history and come to the uh, early 1600s, the 17th century and beyond, as our Baptist movement started to actually gather momentum and coalesce and we actually started to define our identity back in the dark mists of time, the Baptists refined that. That idea of every Christian serving was very core to our identity as Baptists. And so when we look at the table of our Baptist principles, you will see the clause that reads that we believe in the priesthood of all believers. And sometimes from different traditions from overseas and Baptist churches, you might see that referred to as mutual ministry, that we believe in the fact that every Christian should be involved in serving together, mutual ministry. And I think it's uh, just important that we actually recognize that, uh, that we stand alone from many other church traditions, even within the evangelical space, uh, where there is this idea that absolutely every single Christian has been gifted by God to be involved in uh, serving as priests. We're a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood, uh, people belonging to God. And uh, Really, the implications of that royal priesthood are quite simply this, that every single believer is to be involved in the ministry of intercession and worship for, uh, for the glory of God and for the good of the church. The, the actual clause, and you'll recall that from Bible Hour earlier on in this year, reads as follows. We as Baptists believe in the priesthood of all believers, by which we understand that each Christian has direct access to God through Christ our High Priest, that's true, and, and that we work with him in his work of reconciliation. But then that last sentence reads as follows. This involves intercession, worship, faithful service, and bearing witness to Jesus Christ, even to the ends of the earth. So that means quite simply, folk, that there are no professional prayers. There are no professional worshipers. There are no uh, professional pastors and elders and missionaries and so forth that do evangelism and, and ministry. All of us, in some or other way, are called as part of our mutual priestly service to be involved in church life and ministry. Now, Paul was not a Baptist, um, not so certainly in the first century, but as the Apostle Paul puts pen to paper, he writes as if he was a good Baptist, because he outlines that very issue to the church at Rome as the Lord, through the power of his Spirit, inspires and directs him. As we come to Romans chapter 12, and we've read it right from the, the beginning, uh, even this evening, we see that Paul has reminded them of the great truths of salvation and God's mercy. He's taught them how to be holy and acceptable and good and perfect, and not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of their minds. Uh, two Sundays ago, when we were last in uh, this verse, in verse 3, he addressed the issue of hyperinflation. Where Paul says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, in other words, no one is excluded, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So Paul deflates them. Don't think uh, that you're anything particularly special or that you've both got the inside track to God's favor. And uh, we're all equal sinners saved by grace and clothed with his righteousness. 
on the back of that statement, and it's in some ways a little unfortunate that we, we took a week's break, but on the back of that issue of dealing with humility and pride and not putting yourself, uh, pushing yourself to the fore, Paul now comes to handle the issue of spiritual gifting. And in a very practical way, he teaches the church at Rome and by extension us through the centuries how to use those God-given gifts for the good of the whole body. And Paul does that by giving them a very basic lesson in human anatomy and physiology. And we can see that there in verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, comma, dot, dot, dot. And what Paul does right up front is he gives them an illustration. It's a simple illustration, but it's a profound illustration, and it's an important one. It's the one that nobody could miss, both back then and now, because we live with that illustration every single day. We live in our bodies. And folk in the semi-murkiness, so you probably can't see a mirror, but the point is our bodies have different body parts. I'm, I'm insulting your intelligence. It's like preschool learning, you know, eye, ear, nose, mouth. And the point is all of us have got different parts to our bodies and we can name them. We know what they do. We know that we know, we know largely what their function is, etc. Uh, I must say with uh, some degree of pride that my daughter was really, really advanced. At uh, two and a half years old, she had moved way beyond eye, ear, nose, and mouth, and she could name fifth metatarsal. I guess back in 2014, when I fractured that tiny little bone, and it impacted her life, having uh, dad hobbling around a little, a little bit, she actually needed to learn what a fifth metatarsal actually was. What's dad broken? Fifth metatarsal. And uh, anyway, so she was quite advanced at two and a half. But the point is, God has created the body with different structures. And every single organ, every single muscle, every single little bit of tissue and so forth works to fulfill the various processes that keep us alive and keep us functional. And our brains and our eyes and our kidneys and our bones and our liver and our esophagus and cochlea and thumbs and colon and islets of lung enhance and even fifth metatarsals all do different things and contribute to our overall life and health and function. And that's the point that the Apostle Paul is making. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Now, I would be not serving you well if I didn't cross-reference this this evening with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because Paul almost expands on that in a fuller way as he writes to the Corinthians. Almost as if the Romans the Romans got the executive uh, summary or the proceed, uh, but Paul actually fleshes that out. And I think the passage is self-explanatory. So if you're taking notes, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, virtually the whole chapter is useful, but I want to pick up just from verse 12 and read a substantial portion and just see how Paul uh, fleshes, that's a bad pun, but fleshes this out in a, in a real way for us. But just as the body is one and as many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the, in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. I know that. Just break your fifth metatarsal. The entire body suffers as a result of that. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, 
second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Paul gives us a very, very simple picture, and we live with it all the time, our human body. But the point is not to give us a lesson in anatomy and physiology 101. What he's doing is he's showing us a picture of how the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be functioning. He's speaking about the issue of spiritual gifting and our interconnectedness. He's speaking about the priesthood of all believers. He's speaking about mutual ministry, different gifts in different people, all working together for the purpose of edifying the church, building the church up, and glorifying God. Why do I say that? Because if we go back a little bit in 1 Corinthians 12 to a portion I didn't read, we read this, picking up at verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one to each to each, don't miss that, to each Christian, to each believer, to each church member, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There is a profit that comes. I don't have this gifting and what God has enabled me to do for my own good, but for the good of all who have been gathered together and clumped together in a local church. That word that Paul uses there for the common good is a compound word, and it literally means to together together. Your spiritual gifting and my spiritual gifting uh, benefits everyone as we gather together. Now, gifting is never, ever, ever given for our private purposes, but always for the common good. Whatever your gift might be, and we're going to just touch on them, uh, some of them briefly this evening, its purpose is to profit everyone. In fact, interestingly, the Apostle Peter, as he writes in 1 Peter chapter 4, picks up on exactly the same theme. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The gifts are given, whether they're speaking gifts or whether they're serving gifts, where we get our hands dirty in a particular way. Those gifts exist to strengthen and edify and build up the body, and through that, God is glorified. And, folks, that is exactly the angle that Paul takes here in Romans chapter 12, in uh, the, the verses that we've read together. It is a call to involvement. It is a call to mutual ministry. It's a call to be serving. It's a call to be utilizing your gifting. Because every single believer who is saved by God's grace in light of God's mercy, needs to be involved in serving God and serving the church. Now, having said that, and this is on recording, I'm on record with asking this question, let me ask you a provocative question this evening. And this is not, don't, don't go on recording in terms of answering it, but think about it. How many of you on this recording and on the Zoom platform this evening think that you are a charismatic Christian? How many, if we took it a step further, think that we at the Randburg Baptist Church are a charismatic church? And I'd be interested in a discussion forum at some other stage to hear your reasoning as to why or why not you might think or not think that you're a charismatic Christian or that we're a charismatic church. Look, it's provocative in this way, but let me just uh, explain why. If we take all the connotations of abuse away, every single Christian, including all of us here at Randburg Baptist Church, should actually be charismatic Christians. Because the spiritual gifts are gifts of God's grace. It is His charis. It is His grace at work that gives the gifting. And if we're gifted, which we are, we actually should be charismatic because we're utilizing the spiritual gifting that God has given. Unfortunately, over time, the particular label uh, has been narrowed to a subgroup within the church where there are almost an overemphasis on the signs and wonders and the sign gifts and miracles and healings and prophecies and tongues and 
uh, at the extremes, the swinging from the chandeliers and the flipping and the flopping and certainly the abuses of the, the word of faith movement in its extreme and so forth. But let's park that. Now, I don't want to utilize that label. But at its heart, in terms of true New Testament teaching and an understanding, we are charismatic in the fact that we've been gifted by God's grace, by his charis, to serve each other and to glorify him. Every single Christian and every single local church who is exercising their gifting faithfully for the glory of God should be wearing that label with an understanding that we've been faithful to the idea that we've been gifted. Uh, to serve in that way. Hence what Paul says there in verse 6. Having gifts, which you do have, that differ, and don't miss it, according to the grace given to us, according to God's charis that has been poured out upon you as the Spirit sovereignly intended, let us use those graces, let us use those gifts, let us use those uh, supernatural abilities that the Lord has given if prophecy, if service, if teaching, if in terms of uh, giving and uh, uh, contributing, if leading, if in, in the acts of mercy, etc. But all of those are gifts given to us by God's grace. Look, we need to grasp that this evening. I'm not, I'm not going to do, I haven't got time, unfortunately, to do a detailed exposition and dive into all of the, the different um, aspects and nuances of the gifts that uh, we have here. But suffice to say that God has built unity into his church. We're supposed to be keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. But at the same time, there's diversity. There's a diversity of people, backgrounds, cultures, languages, gifting, ministry. And God has contributed in his wisdom to put together the most perfect combination in each local church, just like ours, with a variety of different gifting. And so some might have the, the gift of teaching in various ways, in various spaces. Some might have the gift of giving. Some might have the gift of helps or administration or the gift of leadership or the, the gift of giving in a particular way. There are There is a multitude of, of gifting distributed as God saw fit or sees fit within a local church. Uh, most of us will have more than one gift. Um, some of our gifts might have a stronger manifestation than others, but all of us in some or other way have a con combination of gifts that should be utilized within local church. Now, having said that, when we come to Romans chapter 12, for example, and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I guess to some degree what I read earlier, even in terms of 1 Peter chapter 4, there, there are lists. But folk, I think it's important that we realize that these lists are not necessarily exhaustive. They're just samples in a sense of what are available. So to be ultra analytical and develop lists and boxes and tick boxes and questionnaires and so forth, where we're trying to force ourselves into a particular ball mold and work out what combination we have is is probably to some degree with respect an exercise in, in futility. The Holy Spirit enables people in a very fluid, dynamic way to just go and do what we're supposed to be doing for the good of the church and for God's glory. There are so many different varieties in how a, a particular gift can function, let alone when you put all the nuances together with that. So I don't think it's wise that we come to these New Testament uh, passages and try and catalog them in, a, in an isolated way, in, in an over-analytical way. All of us are gifting, uh, gifted, and they overlap so much that you may well have a, a mixture of gifts. John MacArthur, in one of his books, says this, and I just love the way he actually paints this. It gives us this word picture. He says this, quote, Each of us has one spiritual gift, a blend of the different gifts the Spirit has put together for each of us. Like a painter who is able to create an infinite number of colors by mixing any combination of the ten or so colors he carries on his palette, so the Spirit of God blends a little of one gift with a little of another to create the perfect combination within you. As a result, you have a unique position in the body of Christ with an ability to minister as no one else can, end quote. But what they're saying in a very graphic way is this. You've got a painter. He wants a particular color for a particular shade of, I don't know, I guess, green for a tree and a little bit of green and a little pitch of yellow. And he kind of mixes that together and he kind of creates the perfect light green. And then 
who needs a slightly darker shade for the shadow and maybe adds in a little bit more brown and a touch of blue and a whatever to create that perfect combination that is specifically designed to uh, fit that need. And if we can see that at play within our own lives, the Lord has gifted me in a particular way and you in a particular way with a big dollop of something and a little twitch of something else and it kind of blended together to, so that at this particular point in time, I and you and all of us together are able to serve the Lord and to serve his church. So I guess the perennial question at this stage that surfaces is how do I determine, how do I quantify what my gifts are and what my gift mix is, etc. And maybe even more foundationally, should we uh, be trying to quantify it in a particular way? Are, are gifts uh, static within the life of the church? That if you did a questionnaire back in, I don't know, 1988, and you've got your top three and your kind of next three, that that's the only space that you can kind of function until the Lord returns. Or, are, or should we be looking at this in a more dynamic and a flexible way with different manifestations? And I would certainly tend towards the latter. And I would think that within the life of a local church, as we evolve and uh, do ministry in the particular context that we, we have and we lose people and gain people, that the Lord is always uh, refining us in terms of uh, what we actually have. And even within our own lives, we, we grow and we develop and we're growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And as we mature, you might find yourself being pushed out of areas of service to maybe starting to, to do a little bit of speaking, a little bit of teaching or uh, maybe reading the Bible or pr praying in a particular way that, and then uh, actually growing in those areas. So I would say it's hard to be analytical about that and probably uh, impossible to do that. But uh, certain gifts may certainly dominate for a, a season, but I'm sure others will actually come to the fore. And if, in a particular situation, you're sitting with someone and you've never thought that you had the gift of knowledge or the gift of wisdom. If you're sitting with somebody having coffee and they're asking some hard questions, uh, maybe about theology or maybe about just their lives. And in that moment, it never featured on a questionnaire. The Lord just grants you a supernatural uh, awareness and knowledge of his word that you didn't even know that you had. And you're able to minister that with wisdom and grace into that situation. And then uh, pray uh, a very meaningful prayer at the end. And suddenly you realize, hang on a sec, the Lord gifted me then with knowledge and wisdom and intercession and a, a healthy dose of mercy that just, I didn't even think I had that. But he was utilizing you as part of the body in that particular way. So, fuck, I would, I would just encourage us to think that way. Let's turn the whole thing around. It's not with the cart before the horse. Uh, so often we try and analyze and determine and tick some boxes and then look for areas within church life to serving. I would encourage you, if you're truly going back to Galatians last year, we're truly being filled with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, being in tune and in step with the Spirit. Just look for areas in terms of church life. And uh, trust that the Lord will lead and guide you and gift you and enable you. And when others come and they prompt you and say, won't you get involved? And what about this? Uh, look for those opportunities to even be stretched, trusting the Lord to give you the divine ability. It might not, it might be beyond you, but that will well serve his church moving forward. So focus, we close this evening. That was just a high-speed overview. There's much more to be said. Let me say this as we wrap up. Gifts are gifts. God is the source. And therefore, verse 3 holds true. We shouldn't be thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Everything that I have and everything that you have comes to us from God. There is no grounds for boasting. Gifts are for the benefit of the body. That's the purpose. It's to build the body up and to glorify God. And he in his goodness provides the diversity that we need at the Randwick Baptist Church so that we can be all that he intends us to be and as effective as he wants us to be in terms of ministry. But the bottom line, quite simply, is this. We need to be involved. We need to be involved in mutual ministry. That's what the Bible demands of us. Folk, we're Baptist. We're the Randburg Baptist Church. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. But even beyond that, we believe and stand on the Bible. So as we move forward as a local church, let's be good, faithful, biblical Baptists and jump in and serve God and serve each other for our mutual good and ultimately for his glory. And I leave that with you this evening. In a moment or two, we're going to come to a time of prayer. And I'd encourage you folks to, first of all, just be giving thanks for the gifting that we do have and pray that the Lord would give us more.
more people and more gifted people, uh, but beyond that, that he would indeed stir us uh, to be faithful and diligent, even in our exercise of those gifts.